Hades 2 will be a masterpiece. Anyone who has gone on to play the early access, in which I have, over 45 hours by the time I finished writing this video, will know as much. This isn't breaking new ground, it's not telling you anything you don't know. What it is, is me celebrating a game I love. Something I really should be doing more of on this channel. The reason I haven't been lately is because it's easy to talk about games you enjoy, it's easy to examine games you dislike, but the games that touch a nerve, that become a part of you and stay for the long haul, it's difficult to open up about those. Here goes. The House of Hades is not as we left it off a few years ago. A new tenant has moved in, and he's a crotchety old bastard. The familiar cast of characters, known and beloved by a scary amount of people, especially on Tumblr, are either in chains, not in the picture, or asleep. He's looking at you, Hypnos, bud. Zagreus is missing, poor lad. That means there's a new protagonist in hell. His baby sister, Mel! We'll find a way to wake you, oh sleep. I promise. And Melinui... Melinui is the best child soldier you'll ever get to play as. Trained in witchcraft by the Catonic goddess Hecate, Melinui has but one simple task. To kill time itself. Kronos is the arc-villain of this piece, and what a figure and tone he strikes. Ah, at last. So much different from eponymous Hades himself in the previous game. I'll dig deeper there, but a little more on Melinoe first. I felt a sense of profound identification with her, and every run I've attempted, whether successful or not, has only deepened this kinship. Divine support. Spoilers ahead. Melinui has her own expanding cast of supporting characters. Hecate stands tallest among them, in her role of headmistress and mentor, as well as a somewhat unwitting parent figure. How often must I say I'm not your mother, Melinui? You needn't lavish me with such unbridled praise. I raised you to destroy our common foe. You owe no gratitude to me. Like Meg and Hades himself in the first game, Hecate also serves as the boss encounter of one of the biomes, in particular Erebus, the first biome you will have to pass in your way down to the House of Hades. Another advisor, one I've very much enjoyed, is Odysseus. Tell me you killed the bastard, drove your staff into his wretched skulls with a dagger in his gut. Uh, not that he'd die from that. Works on mortals, though. Wise, wry, and deferential, Odysseus's relationship with Meli is that of a trusted confidant and loyal ally. He's also something of a spymaster, and he's the very first character I took a bath with. Which resulted in a hilarious exchange about the very different sensibilities gods have to nudity compared with the mortals of Odysseus's time. Odysseus has stories for days and an unsurprising amount of personal history with several of the bosses across the game so far. He may be nobody to a certain zero-eyed cyclops, but he's certainly not forgotten the song of Scylla and the Sirens. Several exchanges with both bosses and Odysseus make for hilarious and memorable moments, both before the boss encounters in question and after Mel's return to the crossroads. Oh, you were a wonder to behold. There were the Lystragonian giants, Charybdis, and, lest we forget, the War of Ilium. Speaking of, the crossroads make for a decidedly witchy home base. From the cauldron to Melinoe's tent, and the magical glades that overlook the path up towards Olympus and down towards Tartarus, the design of this encampment is just marvellous. You'll find Hypnos in his own little nook, fast asleep, and the ghost Dora, I wonder who she is, haunting Mel's tent. Who dares disturb my eternal rest? You trifle with powers far beyond your comprehension, witch. Speak! That was pretty decent, right, Mel? Maybe pushing it. 
okay if I call you wench like that? There's a whole support network of shades which you can summon via rituals. The shopkeeper and several accounting shades. There are several ways to relax with the support cast as well. The hot springs I mentioned are one, you'll need bath salts. Another is fishing together via use of fishing lures. And finally, you can go share the drink of the gods, Ambrosia, in the cantina if you grow particularly close to anyone. I've only done so with one character thus far, but it was an excellent time. It's not just Hecate and Odysseus you get to share drinks with either. There's Eris, who will openly work against you and appear as a boss halfway up the wearying road to Olympus. More on that later. Eris has manic energy, and I have to work hard not to crush on her. Something about a girl shooting you with an adamantine rail always gets me going. Could be a character problem. She's Strife Incarnate, and while she's working against Melinoe, Eris isn't necessarily working with Kronos. She's living up to her nature, rather, I suppose. And some of her lines, a number of her exchanges with Mel, they make me think that standing against us might in some twisted way be Eris's attempt to protect Mel from something worse. Or it can just be Eris fooling around. Don't take my words on fate here. We'll wait and see. Eris is fantastic. Catty, and has the energy of a rebellious punk rocker. An excellent minor antagonist. Someone I expect will turn friend eventually. Her sister Nemesis is less antagonist and more a classical foil for Mel. To Kronos? Fine. Got here well before you did. Cleaned up too. Makes you mad, I know. Don't hold back. Let's see how strong you really are. I don't want to fight you, Nemesis. I don't even want to speak with you right now. I'm not asking you to fight me, asking you to hit me. See if you can even make me budge. It'll be worth your while. That goes both for appearance, Mel is light, a sorceress witch, though still possessed by godly power, while Nemesis is what we might elegantly refer to as the big woman. The big woman? The latest in a proud tradition that includes such memorable ladies as Lady Dimitrescu. You know what I speak of, you degenerates. What's more, Nemesis is competition. Despite her post as protector of the crossroads, she'll disobey Hecate and try to make her way down to Tartarus in order to take on the Titan all by her lonesome. In the process, Mel has the chance to tank her hits for awards, to compete to see who can slay more enemies over a hundred golds worth of a wager. There is more. Nemesis might make way for the chamber whose reward you want, or she might have gotten into a chamber you're heading to first and cleaned it out already. Nemesis can be frustrating. It's clear she aims to be. She's angry at Mel, and it's so easy to get angry right back at her. Beyond those surface-level emotions, or maybe because of them, Nemesis is such a compelling character. Her anger, her lashing out at Melly, they are not the results of true enmity so much as they are the workings of envy. Nemesis wants to be in Mel's place. She wants to be the one to take on Kronos. She doesn't have the divine authority, however, nor whatever it is that allows Melinoe to withstand the more sinister time manipulation abilities the hoary old titan keeps in store for those who get too close to him. I've gotten to a point in my relationship with Nemesis where we have reached a grudging respect for one another and even shared a bottle of ambrosia. Plenty of room to grow that relationship still. I love it so. And it's not only because Nemesis is the foil to Mel, but also because she's heavily lancer coded. And I love me a good lancer. I'll mention two more allies, both also the children of night. One is ever faithful Chiron. 
who has become an absolute beast of a guerrilla smuggler. He's no longer just a merchant who's doing a bit of haggling on the down low for his pal Zag. Instead, Mel's paying him with Kronos' freshly stamped gold coins, which he's melting in a show of the most gigantic middle finger to Kronos. Hardcore anarchism against the economic institution, baby! He's great, and I just love that Mel has this intrinsic understanding of his grunts. Suddenly, we get exactly what he means from her responses and I adore that to no end. I might be blanking out on this, but I don't think Zagreus could understand him the way Mel does. Someone remind me. Charon is a sweetheart. There, I said it. Don't at me, unless you're agreeing, which you can't... No, actually, you can do it in the comments below. Up top for my psychopomp. Well, not mine. You know. You get it. A latecomer to the party is Moros, doom incarnate and faithful attendant to the fates. They have a part to play here, too. But I'll let you discover that one for yourself. Moros is a hunk, and I can definitely see him and Meli hitting it off. Princess, we've not met formally. I'm the official bearer of bad news. The Witch of the Crossroads apprised me of the situation here, and was gracious to invite me to stay for now. He's wise and kind and aloof. That last one only makes sense, doesn't it, with the whole Doom thing? He's the new kid on the block, and it's such fun to watch him begin to make a home of the crossroads. The conversations between the two are sweet and kind, and an honest effort of two very different gods to connect in some significant way, with each providing comfort in the face of the hurt that the other is going through. There are more supporting characters, lots more in fact, but I wished to cover only the more finished ones in depth, those who are closest to you and whom you will meet time and again in the crossroads themselves. The smattering of others you meet across your journey, I won't even begin to unpack here. The writing for them continues to be at the very highest of standards, more compelling even than the original. Perhaps one reason, above all, makes it so, however. What works in Melinoe's favour and in the sequel's favour is that the stakes are so much higher. I'm a literature nerd, you see, so I often think in literary terms about games. The first Hades game has a structure and that is part Bildungsroman, part Hero's Journey. Consequential as the stakes are, they are much more personal to Zagreus than they are cosmic. The stakes here, in the meanwhile, are just the highest you can imagine. Olympus is besieged, the gods are at the end of their rope, and the future is looking dire indeed. Suddenly, here's this band of guerrilla witches, a few children of Nyx, and a handful of shades, supporters of the underworld's rightful regime led by a witchy veteran and her godly wisp of a pupil. Sure, she's newly hatched, but Melly, she'll surprise everyone, even Kronos himself. And Kronos. Oh man, is he a loathsome figure! Hades too does an incredible job of creating animosity between the player and this antagonist from the earliest point on. A shadowy figure first appeared after Melly bests Hecate. Pray, who might you be, my girl? And what compelled you to wander in and out of Erebus? I'm not your girl, old man. My name and business are not your concern. So it seems. You appear to be quite pressed for time. Forgive this old man his transgressions. Couldn't have been. With his imperious voice and shadowy portrait, I was convinced that this was none other than the accursed Titan himself. The first few appearances are more inquisitive than outright hostile, but Mel is certainly not any slower than I am. Her own suspicions are there from the get-go. 
The curiosity and probing f questions of the figure shift to open animosity after Milinui infiltrates Tartarus and comes face to face with Kronos. And again, what a striking figure time is. He is almost a foil to Hades in the first game, where the god of the dead was gruff, a man of few words, violent and harsh, but without ever appearing brutal. Kronos strikes a far more sinister note. He is soft-spoken but sly, and prone to fits of rage that are scarier to me than were Hades' own when I faced him with Zagreus. What helps cement him as a villain even further is that the boss fights with Kronos are so bloody difficult. It's not just me either. People on the subreddit are having a hard time. In 45 hours, I've only gotten the best of him five times? Five times! By way of comparison, I once had a running score of either 18 or 21 consequent successful runs against Hades as Zagreus. Grandpappy is not messing around, y'all. I will note, after the early access's second patch, his attacks are apparently better telegraphed, which helps people in the fight. Lack of clarity as to some of his attack animations was certainly an issue at the get-go. Melinui may be destined to delve towards the heart of the underworld alone, but that doesn't mean she's not receiving aid from the family. The Olympian gods are desperate, much as they try not to appear so, and are pulling out all the stops to help their newest extended family member in her one-woman war against Kronos. Alongside many returning gods, Zeus, Poseidon, Aphrodite, Demeter, Artemis, Hermes, a gaggle of never-seen-before deities appear. Apollo, Hestia, Hephaestus, Hera herself. Most significant, perhaps, is Selene, who plays an important part in the symbology around Melinui. Selene, like Melinui, is a member of the Silver Sisters, all moon-blessed goddesses in one way or another. They're a shadowy other to Olympus's radiant mountaintop, to my mind, and if you're interested in me talking more about them, let me know in the comments down below, and I might just cook something up. Chaos returns too, with a portrait that is equal parts fabulous and eldritch fuckery. Both are ample reason to love Chaos. One of the funniest bits for me was Chaos expressing clear preference towards Zag as compared to Mel. He's so nonchalant about it too. The art direction of all these characters is quintessential supergiant games. Even familiar gods have gotten a significant visual upgrade, however. Everyone was having a good time during Zag's struggles. Wartime tells a wholly different story for the Olympians and you'll be getting a lot uh, more armors than you will be getting togas and the like. Well, maybe not for Poseidon, my fellow has peak Australian surfer energy even in times of war. I'm also seriously worried about Zeus, who once or twice mentioned Mel's beauty, especially when he was talking about Aphrodite and Mel together, and last thing I need is fighting off that lightning-throwing creep. Especially with the clear strain between him and Hera so evident, you just know he's the sleazebag king of the gods you have good reason to be wary of. From early on, it's clear that Olympus is in trouble. Hardly surprising then that Mel's relatives are calling for her to come join them up on high in the protection of their stronghold. But wasn't there a good reason for Zack to be unable to withstand spending a long time on the surface of the mortal world? Indeed, indeed, fear not, no one has forgotten this. The workaround is quite elegant. Or at least I found it so. The path to Olympus is much more under construction than the underworld. Art for the supporting characters that Mel meets is in significant earlier stages. 
than almost all the characters you will meet as you wage war on Kronos across the four zones of the underworld. The two biomes on the surface are great fun, and so different from what lies beneath. The city of Ephira has been having some modicum of trouble with the hungry dead, but it's also a playground that offers you a great deal of freedom in choosing boons and other significant rewards. The level design is guided by different principles. The whole place makes for a breath of fresh air. Similarly, with the second biome, which sees Mel traverse an endless fleet of the dead as they sail towards Olympus. I just about fell off my chair when I found out the sea these ships are sailing through is the result of Poseidon getting pissy and doing his earthquake shtick. Men practically helped Kronos along in his plans. Got to respect that level of ineptitude. All joking aside, he is the god of the seas and is probably making life hell for these poor zomboys and zom girls trying to crash, guided as they are, by Kronos's deviant will. I was thinking of doing an in-depth breakdown of the biomes in all their glory, but this script is already overwhelming in its length, near, or actually in fact, at this point, over 3000 words. Do let me know if you'd like a companion video on this topic or a look at the boons and weapons. There's so much to talk about with Hades 2 and I'd happily yap all day long about it. Supergiant Games isn't messing around. There's a way to go yet, of course. The plot has only just begun to develop in a way. That said, so many other elements of the story, interactions and quest lines are already in place, and Supergiant Games has gone on the record to state that the early access of the game is bigger than Hades 1 was in its original state, which, wow! Thinking about the early access of the first Hades game, I can only admire how far Supergiant has come with this beyond the couple of biomes that lead to Olympus, beyond the missing or unfinished artwork of several key and supporting characters, I can think of a few elements I either hope to see or feel are absent. I miss the location, map of the first game, I miss Athena and Ares and Dionysus, but I have no doubt that all of them will make a return in the coming content patches, and if gods like Poseidon and Aphrodite are good indicators when Athena and co return, they will be all the more deadly. And of course they'll be back, Olympus is at war after all, and what better time for both Athena and Ares to shine. And war, well, war runs on drink, let me tell you. But what I love about Supergiant Games is, only a few weeks after releasing this early access, they're already delivering balance patches that make the experience better, and fill in some of the blanks, as Larian did with Baldur's Gate 3, feedback is heard, evaluated and acted upon. Patch 2 dropped recently, and it nerfed the game's most powerful weapon provided plenty of interesting balance changes, removed various Daedalus hammer upgrades for each of the five weapons, so many changes are significant and change the way the game plays in various ways. Oh god, that was such an interesting and sing-songy sentence, I love it. To witness it, I mean, the patching of the game, its organic growth, to be able to take part in shaping the game if you want via feedback, it's a wonderful way to be an active part of this strange and uh, delightful community. What's more, I cannot describe to you the joy of booting up the game and seeing finished art in the place of placeholder art that has been there for close to 40 hours of playtime. When I opened my keepsakes cabinet and finally saw all the brand new art for the keepsakes, that moment, friends, was pure joy. Hades 2 is that rare game that has enchanted me from the first hour, and won't soon be letting go, 
whether you jump into the early access or wait for full release sometime next year. This game is a labour of love that will be remembered for a long time, as a masterpiece and more, as a sequel that leaps onto fantastic new heights that not even its predecessor could have hoped to reach. Am I excited? Hell yeah! If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like it, share it with your friends, ring that bell for notifications for further videos. I haven't been posting lots because I haven't had much time. But if you want more videos on Hades 2, please let me know in the comments down below. And if you have had the joy of experiencing Hades 2, tell me what you thought. If you've only played Hades 1, what is it that you're looking to the most when it comes to Hades 2? Let me know. I'm looking forward to starting a conversation. That famous phrase that all YouTubers use without actually caring about the conversation too much. I, however, care. He lied. Anyway, I will see you next time. I'm Philip Magnus. You're not. Bye! Kronos. You, little one, do not presume to think your movements are invisible to me. I see you plainly where you stand. A trespass for which you shall suffer, although regrettably not by my hand right now.